good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Dali Kushid, as you can see here. So I have, as you read in my biography, I have completed, I recently completed my A-levels and I, I, you must have seen me in many black hole live streams. So for, I'm right now going on, I mean, preparing for my next exams. So today I'll be discussing about uh, the children of the Cold War. Actually, there's supposed to be a the, the here, but uh, they forgot to write it on. So, actually, I already prepared this presentation back in August. Uh, it was thanks to Neyer I got to be here. So basically, in this topic, uh, we look into the Cold War from... Uh, like, basically, we already know, like, uh, how the Cold War was for the men, how it was for the women, and uh, different, different people. We haven't bothered asking a child. I mean, it has happened many times, like, uh, a child asks a question, and we just say, this is a stupid question, or be quiet, or something like that, hmm? if I'm correct. Hmm? So we will be discussing on uh, the children of the Cold War, so, uh, and see how it impacts. Okay, I'd like to make a disclaimer that, first and foremost, I'm not a psychology expert, despite I have taken a psychology in my A-levels. And uh, it may not necessarily reflect. I would also like to thank uh, my mom, who's present uh, for helping me edit this uh, presentation, which we'll be, we will see later. And uh, I'd like to thank, uh, actually there were two events that inspired me to do this. I'd like to thank the first batch of the summer camp uh, for uh, providing, I mean, like as I got to watch them closely, how they are and all that. And I'd also like to thank uh, our dear comrade Hussain Kazi, who spoke here before. Uh, for providing inspiration for this uh, topic. By these two, I ended up here. And I also like to thank the Black Hole team for giving an opportunity to do this. And I also like to dedicate this presentation to my two respective history teachers, Ma'am Rizwana Kasmi, for making me a history enthusiast, especially how she tries to put practical approach into history, like you make us do make a comic books, I mean, not comic, I mean, comic stories. Uh, Comic, uh, comic strips, and then we will also make, uh, I mean, do assignments like uh, make a illustration, visual represent illustration of uh, uh, Egyptian noble's house and all that. And for many years she has done it. So I'd like to thank her for that. I also like to thank my history, my model history teacher, Ma'am Samia Hassan, for making me go nuts for history beyond repair. And if something goes wrong with this presentation, uh, she will definitely exile me to Siberia. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, next. Basically, when we, so first, uh, before we enter, we always uh, have an introduction. So, we will, uh, so we already know that uh, the Cold War is basically the geopolitical tensions between the United States of America and the Union of S Soviet Socialist Republics, mm -hmm. mostly, and uh, how their respective allies. Mm -hmm. Though we don't exactly have a starting and ending point, but uh, most historians, as Robert Service uh, Right, sir. So agree that uh, on the from announcement of Truman doctrine, announcement of Truman doctrine to the dissolution of the Soviet Union, was uh, the timeline of the Cold War. Okay, and when we define a child, so basically a child is defined as a person not yet of age of majority. So most of the, in some con most of the countries we agree that it is 18 the age of majority, but uh, in some jurisdictions like Saudi Arabia where it is 15 years. You are classified as adults, so all that. So we will now explore how the Cold War had an impact on children from a rational sphere to playing an active part in the geopolitical tensions of the two superpowers. So first off, we will discuss the beginning of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. So in the big, so when the, as the Iron Curtain was being laid out, uh, different propagandas uh, were coming from both sides of the block. Uh, one was, and it came with different mediums like films, TVs, arts, and in sports, uh, posters, comics, and etc. Like uh, there were famous rivalries, like uh, rivalry of uh, Boris Spassky and uh, Robert Fisher in chess, and uh, then uh, they also an uh, example of a film is like *Here Right Nightmare*, which is basically a U.S. from the U.S. Hmm. Where basically hmm, it is about uh, a father hmm, who is who is very much like how a typical American should be. Uh, when what if so all of a sudden it turned into a 
US becomes a communist state. So like it's a whole f film. Actually, quite hilarious in the sense that uh, in that film that uh, actually one of his daughters actually had more f got to have more freedom to choose to work on this collective farm, which otherwise uh, her father wouldn't approve of. Okay, so we have one film example here. Then uh, this poster you see here is basically comparison of uh, a Soviet school and uh, an American school. Basically, this is from the Russian side. So here they say that uh, years, I mean, uh, that the uh, Russian schools are better off while in the USA schools are like uh, how they are. Uh, not exactly true, but somewhat true. I mean, if you look at today, their geography, they can't even, uh, some of even placed Iraq in the middle of the US. So basically, when the, the children get exposed to such, I mean, they, these propagandas are everywhere. So they already get, get the impression of like, okay, so how are the, Soviets are, and from the Soviet Union, how the Ameri Americans are, and then like that's how it impacted them, if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I explained well enough, but anyways. Okay, next uh, we have then entered the nuclear arm race. Okay, so as you can see that on 29th of August 1949, the Soviet Union tested RDS-1, making them enter in the arm race. So ever when the Soviets tested uh, their first bomb, a nuclear bomb, it caused a very huge panic in the US because initially uh, they were the ones who had a monopoly over the atom, atom bombs and everything. But all of a sudden now they also have an atom bomb. So it was a big uh, issue. Like what if they fired the nuclear bomb on the US or what if uh, mm -hmm. all that? So then ever since they started this uh, nuclear drills, as you can see the children, uh, the duck going under the tables uh, and like trying to protect themselves in case of a nuclear attack. And this uh, is based on the film from uh, Bert uh, the Turtles. But the turtle who it told, uh, like it showed us that if uh, a nuclear attack happens then you basically duck and Duck and all that. Actually, this whole ducking uh, process, ducking cover drill, it basically it comes from the uh, findings of the Atomic Bomb Com Casualty Commission, which was sent to Hiroshima. So when uh, when they went and uh, went there to study, and by study I mean only study. There was no discussion of treatments or all that. That was uh, for the Japanese to sort it out. Hmm? So they noticed that uh, the, the people who hid behind concretes and all that, and we like duck and cover, hmm, they had a, their survival chances to increase. So from there, they learned that uh, if they all, if everyone ducks and covers, they would, uh, hmm, they can avoid radiation and all that. Okay, with all these uh, duck and cover drills and also already fear amongst the adults that uh, what if a nuclear attack happens on the US <laughs> because now the Russians also have the bomb. So actually, <laughs> it also comes down to children. As I remember my own uh, neighbor, <laughs> neighbor, when this Fulama ha attack happened three years ago, so there was uh, fears e even across media that what if maybe we might end up as in a war with uh, India. So it went to, as it, it kept on going and going, and even uh, it went to my neighbor's daughter, who was very scared uh, when she saw like what was going on on the news and all that. So like that's how similar fears are there when uh, everybody's panicking about uh, the potential nuclear war and uh, they have to do duck and cover drills and all that. Hmm? Though there were attempts to assure the children about nuclear threat use of science fiction and all that. If you all have read, I mean, most, I think most of you have read the Marvel, co Spider-Man comics, Superman comics. Remember they say that in the Spider-Man comics that uh, they, a spider bit uh, hmm? Tony Park, uh, uh, the, the, the Peter, hmm? Park. Peter, Park. Peter Park, thank you. Peter Park, uh, so he became Spider-Man and all that. And then uh, Superman fighting against uh, radiation type uh, monsters and all that. So it, basically it was to reassure uh, the children that uh, if there's nothing to fear about. But uh, even despite those, there's still fear as uh, in that, uh, this video I just mentioned, there was a line which said, 
Older people will help us as they always do, but there might not be any grown-ups around when the bomb explodes, then you are on your own. So, uh, yeah, there were still fears about a potential nuclear war amongst the children. So they, like, uh, and all that. And it went on. So, uh, apologies that I couldn't get a chronology. So, it went to the point that uh, one, t one time, there was uh, this uh, girl named Samantha Smith. So she was also worried about the potential nuclear war. So, mm -hmm. okay, at the time, I, I, this happened all in the 80s. So at that time, uh, Ronald Reagan was in office. And then Ronald Reagan uh, mm -hmm, called for a strategic defense initiative, peace to strength, which basically, we want peace with the Soviets, but uh, we still stockpile uh, arms and all that, like peace to strength, literally. And then uh, Ronald Reagan also made a called the Soviets uh, evil empire until uh, evil empire. So like you already get uh, that's how it was in the U.S. Uh, U.S. Uh, at the time when she wrote this letter to Yuri Andropov uh, about uh, nuclear war, uh, she about whether they will go. Are you going to vote to have a war or not? That was literally what was written in her letter. Later, it got published in Pravda paper, and eventually she got a response where uh, Yuri Andropov uh, said that, uh, I mean, she was, basically she directly asked uh, the, uh, anyways, wherever, I'm losing mind. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, so she eventually got a response where uh, Yuri Andropov said that uh, mm -hmm. just as uh, you are fearing that there might be a potential nuclear war, the Soviet, uh, the people in the Soviet Union also feared that if there's a, what if a nuclear war happens? So, so like, uh, so like uh, he even invited uh, Samantha Smith to come to the Soviet Union in the summer vacations and see for yourself uh, the Soviet Union. So her, fa her trip, uh, I mean, on the July of that year, I mean, next year, in 19 July in 1983, she came to the Soviet Union and uh, spent a month or two over there. Mm -hmm. And uh, she got, uh, she saw that how, uh, it was heavily televised. Uh, mm -hmm. So at the end in the Moscow press conference, she said that uh, they were just like us, they also wanted peace. Mm -hmm. So basically, her favorite, her trip is a bit, uh, her trip uh, to the Soviet Union kind of contradicted most of what the Ronald Reagan uh, gave an impression of the Soviets, like uh, evil empire, evil, mm -hmm. like we, uh, they are very dangerous people, and all. it kind of contradicted. Mm -hmm. And she went on to advocate for uh, peace between the two powers until her tragic, jet, she died tragically in a plane crash. Now to the topic I am most uh, interested in, uh, espionage and uh, espionage, hmm? uh, espionage, uh, or in layman's term, spying. So as we all know that uh, using children to spy is very old, it has been there even since uh, prehistoric times, mm -hmm. I mean, not prehistoric, but it's like ancient Greece and ancient Rome, they have been used to, f to collect info and all that. Hmm? So as we all know that Cold War itself was mostly about spying on each other, so the children were also used. So I will like, tell, uh, like to tell about two... Mm -hmm. Actually, they're still... I mean... Uh, so I would like to tell uh, about uh, two case studies where uh, there were children actively used, and one case study where... Uh, actually, most, as you all know, that spies don't normally tell... Uh, mm -hmm. That we are spies, of course. Uh, why would they? <laughs> <laughs> so there will also be a case study about uh, when the children, uh, when their parents got arrested for spying. The children finally figured uh, learned that uh, basically their parents were involved in spying and all that. Actually, the spying is still ongoing these days. Uh, mm -hmm. Recently, the United Kingdom. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He passed a bill called uh, the Covert of Human Intelligence uh, Sources uh, Criminal Conduct Act uh, to the last year, so which uh, was heavily debated, like uh, granting immunity to use of minors uh, mm -hmm. 
to, like if uh, that minus can be used to by any agencies to carry out to spying operations for different government departments, and they will be granted immunity if uh, they commit a crime or a crime. Mm -hmm. So they're still. So next time you go to UK, do keep a lookout to, <laughs> though they won't tell. So first, uh, I like to talk about the Doherty kids. Though it may sound, it may look fictional. Even I took it, I thought it was fictional, but it was based on a true story. So the Doherty kids were basically three children, the eldest one being Mark, then Sue Ellen, and then Amanda, who from their birth had been helping their parents. Uh, their parents were part of the Australian Secret, uh, Security Intelligence Organization, which is basically like MI5, uh, FBI, and uh, uh, I have a version of uh, I, uh, Internet Intelligence Bureau, which uh, is pretty much non-existent. <laughs> non-existent. <laughs> no, no, they do exist. They do exist, but we don't hear much from them as compared to inter-service intelligence. <laughs> okay, okay, anyways. You're right, Miriam. So they first helped their, uh, hel helped their parents in this uh, first uh, bugging operation called Operation Smile, where they were supposed to spy on this uh, Soviet agent named Fedor Dosev. So basically, they were supposed to collect info from them. So what they did was uh, the a ASIO uh, rented an apartment upstairs to where he lived and then uh, set up all the bugging machines and all that too. So one day, he got a bit suspicious of the Doherty family. So he went to above the flat and like knocked on the door and was like, uh, hmm? "Yeah, it's probably spying on me." Hmm? So to quickly cover up, they quickly used uh, the eldest one, the Mark. Uh, Mark. They quickly used like, uh, he, you know, as a bit impolite to hmm? all that. So then later they went on to help and they helped and uh, it was like uh, help in a sense like uh, they were even given uh, training like. Uh, hmm? Hmm? Like when they were first day go to, going to school, then uh, Amanda was heavily, highly practicing uh, that uh, in case their parents, I mean teachers ask uh, what their father does, then they just say that he works for the government. And if they ask for a specific, uh, specifically which one, then just the attorney's department, which was basically a, a close case. Like uh, nothing, it was, like, it was a very boring job, attorney's department and all that. Uh, so uh, she kept on practicing attorney's department, attorney's department, attorney's department, and all that. And also then uh, their uh, father would take them out for outing by outing, uh, basically looking at the car, memorizing the number plates and all that. And they had to make sure that they remember exactly what's written because uh, once the car passes, it never will come back. So they had to work on number plates and all that. And then they would go to political rallies and all that. And if they had to take a photo of someone, they, the photo of the target, what they would do is, uh, when they were still infants, they would just put, uh, like for example, put uh, the child hair on the table and where the target is standing, and then take a photo, like on the, they pretend like they're taking a photo of the child, mm -hmm. the infant, when in fact they were taking the photo of the mm -hmm. target. And yeah. So Yes, basically actively using the kids for spying. Mm -hmm. And they later also played a minor role in the Petrov affair. So basically the Petrov affair was a high defection case in uh, where uh, two, I mean, there was a so two Soviet agents who defected to Australia. So it was a high profile case. Uh, it even caused the Labour Party of Australia to split. Mm -hmm. So basically it was a high, so like, uh, mm -hmm. After the whole Petro affair, which happened in 1954, uh, where they negotiated uh, defect, like the like the agent Russian agent said that he will like to defect to, to Australia, they will hmm? also negotiating like what information he will be carrying and uh, all that. Hmm? And it was a, uh, I mean, yeah. So in, after the whole 1954. Uh, hmm? Petrov affair. So although they were given uh, asylum, like uh, they can stay in Australia and all that, the, the Soviet agents. But then, uh, when the 1956 Melbourne Olympics uh, was to happen, so uh, you know the uh, the KG, So they were the Australian government was afraid that if 
Australian government was afraid that uh, the Soviet, I mean, the Soviets will be sending their coaches and sports uh, officials and all that, who are in fact uh, KGB in disguise. So they wanted to hide the, the two agents uh, mm -hmm. for the duration of the 1956 Melbourne Olympics. So they were again, the family was again consulted and. Uh, mm -hmm. They went on a pretense on a holiday. So basically, their role for the mine Petrov affair was they were supposed to act as grandchildren to the those Russian agents who defected while the Melbourne Olympics was going on. And they went on to help the parents until their father passed away in 1970. Quite a long time. A long time. Okay, next. And then, uh, while uh, what I have discussed now is from the Western Bloc, now in the Eastern Bloc, uh, so uh, so they will mm -hmm. so uh, during the dictatorship of Nicole Ceausescu, how you pronounce the name, mm -hmm. Ceausescu, there were uh, so uh, there were certain declassified files which. Uh, have been mm -hmm. where uh, it said that thousands of Romanian children as youngest and were recruited by the security. So basically, during the time, uh, basically, uh, there were uh, the Eastern Europe was uh, mm -hmm. like you know, there was a solidarity movement, the uh, Berlin Fall was falling, and all that. So Nicole Ceausescu felt a bit uh, paranoid mm -hmm. and all that about uh, like. Uh, if this can happen to the Eastern Europe, then it could happen to in Romania, mm -hmm. like collapse of communism. So he had these uh, child agents uh, to mm -hmm. to spy on their friends, uh, spy on their family, like basically like uh, how in back in World War Two we learned about uh, the Hitler Youth and uh, Giovanni to Italia the Littorio, basically the Italian version of uh, Hitler Youth. So you know how they were like. Uh, if they go against the party lines or anything, they would just uh, report against uh, mm -hmm. the parents or uh, mm -hmm. class fellows, teachers, and whatever. Mm -hmm. So they were also doing the same task. Mm -hmm. So they were expected to tell the security handlers that about their friends and families, uh, their opinion of the, the Communist Party. Have they been contacting uh, any foreigners outside, or have they been listening to foreign radio? Mm -hmm. And this went on till uh, the Romanian uh, Revolution of 1989, it went on. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, next uh, we have, uh, as I mentioned before, we, will, uh, we have the Rosenberg kids. Uh, you may all be familiar with uh, Julius and Ita Rosenberg, even Fez Ahmed Fez uh, mm -hmm. wrote a poem about them, Ham Jo Tariq Raho Mei Mare Gay. Basically, I, isn't, uh, sorry, my Udo is very terrible. I will just translate it. We were killed in the darkest lanes, uh, as far as I'm Yes, yes. So basically, uh, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, basically, it was that, uh, it was 1950s, that time was Joseph uh, McCarthy had his McCarthyism, mm -hmm. McCarthyism, where uh, basically, mm -hmm. they, according to him, there were communists infiltrating in different uh, government sectors and all that. Uh, which basically, I mean, which is more like, uh, is another way of like, uh, if you don't like someone, you just say they're communist and then the FBI will just take them away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's literally how McCarthyism was going. Mm -hmm. It's something like uh, the last minute cases, like uh, how we. So, mm -hmm. so Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, uh, they were mm -hmm, arrested for passing nuclear secrets, allegedly, allegedly nuclear secrets. It was never proven. Mm. Uh, even if they were proven, uh, it was very lame evidence and all that. So they were later executed. So they left the two boys named Mark and Robert, mm -hmm, who had no idea that their parents were involved in spying and all that. Mm. Now, this Julius and Ita Rosenberg case was a big case in the U US. Uh, mm -hmm. That they were sp so, mm -hmm. like they were, they were spies and all that. Like, Spies and all that. So it was a huge case. So 
they kept on changing from once they became orphans they were transferred to different families and led to an, later to an orphanage basically the problem is that uh, their extensive extended relatives and all that they were a bit hesitant to, uh, to look after these two as because uh, the whole media was concerned of, the whole public was concerned about the Rosenbergs uh, case, uh, the Rosenberg case. So they didn't want to associate with this, themselves with uh, the Rosenberg. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, eventually they landed in the Miropol household, uh, mm -hmm. the Miropol household. Later, as they grew up, they late went on to campaign for their parents' exoneration, mm -hmm. where they later learned that uh, basically the father was a spy. He was spying for the Soviets, but he was just a military spy. He, did, he was just passing military information, not to anything related to nuclear uh, secrets and all that. While his wife, uh, so they had to acknowledge that. While the, his wife, uh, Ethel Rosenberg, uh, wasn't even mentioned in the Soviet uh, list of uh, agents operating uh, in that area. Mm -hmm. She was just the uh, typing and all that. Uh, and then later we entered the 1960s. Uh, okay, so in the 1960s, uh, there were a lot of protests against Vietnam War, campaign for civil rights, and other protests. Uh, but uh, right now, as uh, I mean, there was a Little Rock, uh, Arkansas, where there were some bl black students uh, who, who federal uh, tro troops had to be brought in uh, so they can go to the, uh, white, all white school uh, safely because the state governor and all the state uh, didn't want to let them in and all that. But that is a domestic issue. Right now, I am focused on uh, the 19, uh, like from the, the Vietnam War. So in the Vietnam War. Uh, so, uh, the, when, uh, so in the Vietnam War, it was a heavily, we all know that basically the Vietnam War happened uh, because, uh, because of uh, America's uh, this domino theory as uh, brought up by Eisenhower that if Vietnam fell, then Laos will fall. If Laos falls, then Cambodia will fall. And if Cambodia falls, then Bangladesh will fall and India will fall. And basically, all, like all that. Though it's a bit dramatized, but that's how they were taught. So when the war was going on, <laughs> So there were a lot of uh, TV crews, photographers, and uh, sending reports back home. And uh, for one, I mean, like uh, for once, the people in the U.S. themselves could, from their homes, uh, could see living rooms, uh, could see like what was going actually going on in the war. Mm -hmm. Initially, mm -hmm. it wasn't that uh, heavily, heavily reported. So of course, uh, they weren't uh, happy with how the Vietnam was going, using chemical weapons, uh, biological weapons, uh, chemical weapons and all that, napalm and all that. So they were not just adults watching, they were also kids watching. So when they see like photos like the napalm gun, like this one, so you know, if you observe children carefully, they. <laughs> They kind of re they mostly relate to when they see their peer, uh, mm -hmm. uh, peer uh, mm -hmm. what's going on in their peer uh, and uh, yeah and all that. So when this, so although the elementary or middle schoolers couldn't uh, protest, uh, the high schoolers and the high schoolers uh, play the role in uh, the hippie movement. Like they have this hippie movement, they protest against the norms. Uh, Basically, the 1950s, with this, back in the 1950s, they were, America was going through a period of, uh, was going through normalization, like uh, try to enter, like try to return back to normal, like before the Second World War started. And the uh, concept of uh, normalcy was a bit uh, strange. It was mostly focused on the all white uh, colored people where like uh, nobody talks about them. So all that. So so in the normalization, they talked about uh, obedience to pair, like uh, obedience to father, and the wife uh, should be loyal to the husband, and uh, mm -hmm. like uh, children should obey the parents, and like uh, mm -hmm. try to pursue education and uh, mm -hmm. fight for the. I mean, help mm -hmm. uh, fight for uh, help uphold American values and all that. So when most uh, most uh, high school students, when they saw uh, what was going on in Vietnam, they said, "Is this what they will? What you going to send us to? Fight in that uh, war? Why should we go and fight?" Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they did. Uh, they protested by dropping out of schools. A lot of them dropped out of the schools in protest. Like, why should they go and? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
why should they uphold the values uh, their parents have set? Yeah, yeah. Why should they uphold the uh, and all, uh, killing the families and all? Why should they uphold? So they protest. They dropped out, and they had this whole hippie movement and all that. Uh, hmm? Hippie movement. Uh, yep. I think that's uh, for the 1960s. I think this was a very okay. And then we come to the 1970s and 80s. I think most of you are familiar that uh, when uh, in your child, in the 1980s uh, there was a war and Afghan the Afghan war was going. They supply weapons and funds to the. That's how the proxy comes deprived. Then their schools are also blown up, so the education deprived. Hmm? Interrupted. And some, uh, some, I mean, and and some children end up uh, suffering injuries. Hmm? Some injuries of us uh, guess, uh, they suffer from like like uh, uh, this. They get the handicap, become handicapped with, as a result of landmines, sh gunshots, and. Uh, Bob explosions and all that, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and some uh, and some even uh, end up uh, losing their parents and uh, their homes, and then uh, this is not just physically they suffer, but also mentally they suffer from post traumatic stress disorder. As uh, you know, I mean, because uh, for for small children, it is actually. Mm -hmm. Too much for a child. Uh, like uh, there's one bomb explosion going there, one bomb explosion going there, uh, uh, some firing going on, uh, uh, and uh, all that. Uh, uh, so it's like too much for uh, like it just shuts, like they just uh, uh, is is too much for the children, and they also suffer severe depression and anxiety, increased anxiety, and then uh, lack of trust. Like who they are not sure who exactly to trust. So here is a case, case of uh, Mohammed Hussain Famida. So basically, he was a child soldier who said in the passage. Basically, Iran Iraq war uh, happened as a result of uh, one. There was a there was a dispute, uh, waterway dispute uh, between Iraq and Iran over by. I mean, there was a water name way named. Uh, Shat al Arab, which connects from uh, where all Tigris and Euphrates uh, connect them from where uh, the Persian Gulf starts. So there was a dispute over there, like who gets to control it. And also, then Iraq also wanted to achieve hegemony across the Persian Gulf and replace Egypt as the, the dominant power in the Middle East. And then uh, things got a bit worse when uh, the Iranian uh, revolution happened. and. Uh, the Ayatollah wanted to ex like said that uh, they shall exp they, they will export the revolution abroad. So Saddam Hussein was a bit concerned. I mean, there were concerns for Saddam Hussein. So first line of defense was aggression, was the approach. So uh, they went to fight in the Iran Iraq was started. And because it was very concerning for, not just for Saddam Hussein, it was also concerning for the Americans and the Soviets. So in a very rare occasion that both the Soviet Union and the US backed Iraq. Though the Soviets did, fund, I mean, back the Iranians to North Korea. So he was around 13 years old when he left his home to fight in the war without telling his parents. He participated in the first battle of Karam Shah, where he fought. Basically, the problem with the unit he was fighting, working for the Baslij. Basically, it was a poorly equipped uh, group. There were children as young as 12 and people as old as so 70 who were fighting in that uh, unit. Mm -hmm. So he, okay, we are not sure exactly. Why he decided to go and fight? Uh, according, to, but according to what I heard, uh, from uh, what I heard, is basically uh, that he was a deep follower of uh, uh, a deep follower of uh, Imam, I mean the Ayatollah and all that. So he decided uh, uh, decided to fight. So later he embraced uh, mart he got uh, martyrdom from uh, basically killed when he blew himself up, uh, disabling in a Iraq attack. He was celebrated as a war hero. And Hero in Iran and has been bestowed the other fat first grade. Okay, so all the my the big so his story was used by the Iranian state media to motivate other children to go and fight mm -hmm. fight the war against Iraq and all that. 
like that's a, like a British brainwashing, as one would say. Hmm? One would say, hmm? and all that too. Hmm? And risk that to protect their country hmm? when in fact uh, they should. Yeah. Next, uh, we have the dissolution of the Soviet Union, and, and then at the end, uh, on tw the Christmas of 1991, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev announces his Basically, what led to it, basically we all know that uh, the Soviet Union uh, was began to collapse as uh, Mikhail Gorbachev introduced his glasnost and perestroika. So glasnost is blas political openness, perestroika is... Uh, economic openness. Uh, basically, he was aiming to reform uh, communism, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, not everyone agreed with his views, <laughs> especially the hardline communists, they didn't agree with his views. Mm -hmm. So, and also by giving glass notes, like political freedom, uh, basically it led to all the independence movements across uh, all the Soviet, I mean, all the republics in the USSR. And uh, eventually, they all uh, opted out. Uh, slowly, slowly, they all opted out of also uh, opted out Kazakhstan being one of the last until officially on Christmas of 1971. Hmm? Hmm? And uh, Mikhail Gorbachev announced his resignation. And also, then the Afghan war also contributed to the decline of economy in the hmm? because it was because they fought for so many years. So. A lot of money was spent on uh, Afghan wars. So, uh, the econ economy was crippling. Uh, in, uh, so uh, by these factors, uh, the USSR collapsed. Uh, and Mikhail Gorbachev later announced his resignation. And the following day, the voting happened, and Soviet Union ceased to exist. So when the actually it has uh, when the dissolution happened, uh, it came, troubles came, especially for children. That. Uh, hmm? The, that uh, now USSR was no more, uh, now uh, USSR was no more, so like now where are, where, where, what are they part of? Actually, in the Soviet Union, it's, part, it's very common, uh, like uh, you may have a Kazakh mother or a Russian father or like, like a mix, uh, different uh, 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 ethnic groups. Now, uh, 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 the, the every all the republics went separate, uh, so like where to go, hmm? where to go to, hmm? where they should go, and then hmm? some became orphans because while uh, the refugees were being, uh, hmm? while they were by uh, some were migrating to their respective countries, uh, there was a lot of firing going on. Uh, even uh, hmm? I have a aunt from the Soviet, my Soviet aunt. Uh, hmm? <laughs> my Soviet aunt. She's not exactly my aunt, but uh, I, in Russia they also have uh, like uh, addressing uh, elder ladies as aunt and uncle and aunt. So my Soviet aunt uh, lost her brother while uh, when the dissolution was happening. Uh, 